some of you well know. I don't want to trample any of our adults. I keep saying I'm going to bring like a bag full of big Hershey's uh, uh, bars or Snickers or something like that. These kids just, I just, I'm so envious of them when they come out of junior church with all the stuff they come out with. You know, I, you know, I don't know. You know, Brother Lee just, it's unfair competition. And uh, I feel like that's the reason they all are so enthusiastic when they leave. And so hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully, you know, never mind. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. This is our last week in our series in Revelation. And I want to just put in a little plug for two things. First of all, this evening's message, you should come tonight. We're going to be preaching from 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. And, you know, there are a lot of people, there's, there's uh, just a lot of false doctrine about end times that are going on right now. And a lot of people have been taught really a, a dangerous and disheartening doctrine that the next thing on God's calendar isn't Jesus coming. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't want to be an individual that faces God's wrath, God's judgment. I don't want to be part of that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it really is one of those teachings that frightens and uh, not, just, not only frightens, but gives a real misunderstanding about God and His attitude toward believers. Let me just give you just a, just a quick statement. I grew up in a first-generation Christian home, and, I, you know, it was really, really privileged to have parents that just got into the, to the teaching and preaching of the Word of God and responded to it. But one of the doctrines for a while that was off, not so much with my dad, but uh, with my mom in our household, was the matter of the... God's wrath and the tribulation when God judges the wicked like we've seen the events of in Revelation. And I remember uh, just my mom telling us as kids things that probably don't realize just terrify kids to death. But we describe events that had to do with God's terrible wrath and judgment. And it, I remember even hearing preachers when I was five, six, seven years old, they would say things like, well, you kids, you know, you might not, you might want to think about never getting married. Because uh, you know it's just going to be so terrible. You know, fathers are going to be against mothers and children against parents, and and uh, you know it, it, when when God's wrath uh, comes and when these events happen, it's just going to be so terrible. And I'll tell you something that gives a real misunderstanding about God and His love and His character. God's wrath has never been directed toward His children. God's wrath is. I mean, when you look at what God's wrath actually is, this is not this is not persecution like what we face when, when an individual who hates God persecutes a believer. We're talking about the God in heaven who has all power and whose wrath is more terrible than we can imagine being misdirected at believers. And that's not God's mind towards you. So it's important for us to have it. We'll be preaching a message about that specifically this evening. And also next Sunday morning we're going to begin a series in the Gospel of John. And that will correlate and it will be a real help to you as you're planning on this year becoming an effective soul winner. The purpose in our soul winning saturation, this our training on Saturdays, is that we want to not just go out sharing the gospel, but we want to preach the gospel and see people affect. Folks, there's plenty of room right up here if you want to come on up. Everybody turns around and looks at you anyway, so you might as well walk in front of them. But feel free to come up and take a comfortable seat. By the way, when the kids are dismissed, and you got the little pandemonium going on. If you want a better seat, just go ahead and move and take the kids' seats right after they uh, dismiss. And that won't offend me, or I haven't mentioned that in a while. But sometimes we're really crowded in here, and there isn't a lot of room for everyone to sit down. As soon as, soon as they're seated, that's a good time if you feel the need to move up and get closer uh, so you can see me. Uh, <laughs> you know, in our massive auditorium here, but I want you to be comfortable doing the service. All right, so we're going to begin a series in John, and that is going to correspond and correlate really to our soul winning this year, be a real help to you to get settled about the gospel. And John's gospel is the place to really get settled on the clarity of it. And that will be an important one for you to participate in. Here you are in Revelation chapter 22. And if you'll please look with me down to verse 12, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter this morning for our context in our text. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me, get to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. Notice this word, we haven't seen it since chapter 1. Blessed. 
are they that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Don't you love the way that John finishes out this letter from the Holy Spirit? And just the comfort, the comforting words that this book, which has some terrifying aspects and elements to it, ends up with for those that receive Jesus. Let's pray for God's help in understanding the Scripture as we summarize this morning, shall we? Father, thank You so much for what we've learned thus far as we've been studying in the Revelation. It is our desire, God, that You would give us an understanding of this book of, the, of Your Word to the degree that we would be among those that are blessed because of what's written in it and because we've heard and done those things. Now we pray that You would help us as we apply the final conclusion of this letter today. I ask that You would help us to really apply it in our lives and to see the results that You promise in Your Word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just do a quick overview. I, I use the word quick and then overview all at the same time. It's probably a little disingenuous. I want to do a long, drawn-out overview of <laughs> the Revelation uh, with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, no, this morning. So, yeah, it'll be afternoon by the time I'm done with my overview. <laughs> uh, I want to just kind of review some of the things that we've looked at. And I want to just encourage you with a couple of things. I'm going to ask Brother Tony to make sure that our series on Revelation is all together on online so that if you missed if you've missed parts of it as you've studied through it, that will make sure that it's all where you can go and catch up on it. You may know this by now, but I think that everyone does. It's just not the same when you watch something online as when you're in the place. I used to wonder why that was. Years ago, I remember being in, in not just years ago, but I remember realizing that I had been in services where, man, God was moving. You know, the Scripture promises that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So literally... God's Spirit in a place where believers are assembled. God's Spirit is not restricted to living in the individual. He's in the room. He's in the place. And I've been in, in places where under the preaching of the Word of God, it was evident that God's Spirit was in the place. And I mean, He was moving mightily. And i just been in, in, in where the Spirit of God was taking the preaching, the message, and just using it in a very, very powerful way. And so a lot of times as a result of that, I've gotten a copy of the message that was preached, and to either share with other folks because of the impact it had in my life and felt the value of it. And a lot of times I listen to it, maybe when I'm driving in a vehicle and I'll play it in the vehicle, and really remembering the impact that message had. And then while I'm listening to it, I'm thinking, yeah, it's a good message, but it's really not all that amazing. I wonder what it was about it. Well, it's the place, and having the power of the Spirit of God in that place. And so I'd encourage you. <coughs> You know, be in, in the place where the Word of God is preached, where the believers are assembled together, because God will do works and things in your heart that just that just aren't do, able to be duplicated at another time and another place. And uh, so I want to let you know about the, the you know, be, you, can, you can catch up on our series in Revelation. And the reason for that, the motivation behind making sure that you, you study this, this revelation of mysteries that were previously sealed up, and people weren't allowed to know, the reason to do that is because God promises that you get to be blessed because of it. That was one of the first things that we saw in our series in, in chapter 1. If you want to kind of uh, thumb through the letter of Revelation with me, you could go to chapter 1 and we'll just do a quick overview. Uh, I say quick and I think it will be. In verse 3 of chapter 1, uh, John is told this, as he's told to write, give a record of the things that were revealed to him by the Spirit. 
He so blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. If you will do the things that Revelation says you ought to do in order to keep the words of prophecy, there's a promise of God's blessing. Now, I'm one who is careful about not stealing something from someone else. There are times when God has promised blessing to Israel, or blessing to Abraham, or blessing to Isaac, blessing to Jacob. And each of those promises that God would make to those individuals uh, were certainly, they certainly revealed the character of God and His attitude toward us. But a promise to someone else is not necessarily a promise to me. So I get pretty excited when I'm reading in the New Testament of the Scripture about something that I know this is mine. This <coughs> promise is for me. Remember in John 17 when Jesus was praying for His disciples and He prayed for them that would believe? And when I read that verse, I think Jesus was praying for Ryan Price in John 17. And that just has special uh, implications for me. It just means something special to me to know that Jesus had me in mind before He went to the cross and that He was literally praying for them that would believe, the future believers, and that that's God's attitude. Then just, It just makes it mean so much more to me. Well, this is sort of a, an akin truth in Revelation 1. Blessed is everyone that readeth. Uh, every person that reads. Is that you? Did you read the Revelation? Uh, and then the Bible says and that hear the words of this prophecy. So you're open to hear it. And then it goes on to say, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We're going to look at the conclusion to that verse in chapter 22 uh, today, and we're going to look at keeping the things that are written in the book. In other words, God doesn't give us prophecy so that we can know things. He doesn't do it to tickle our intellect or uh, to have us you know, have things that we enjoy thinking about. He gives us truth so that we can know how to live. And God wants us to live the things that we've learned in the Revelation. And there's a num there are a number of those things that we'll see today. Another thing that we saw as we were studying through Revelation 1 is in verse 19, and that is the outline for the letter to uh, for this letter. And the outline is this. Write the things which thou hast seen. Past, present, or future. What's hast seen? Past tense, right? And then... And the things which are, past, present, or future, are present. present. And the things which shall be hereafter, past, present, or future, future. And so here we find the outline of the letter. The outline of the letter is things that are past. Evidently, from the context, we know that that's John telling about his experience on the Isle of Patmos when the uh, Holy Spirit of God gave him this, this letter, when he sent the messenger to give him this information. That happened in the past. Present, we know from our context, begins in chapter 2. When uh, In chapter 2 and chapter 3, we see the letters to the seven churches which are at Asia. And that is a reminder to us also of something that we see, that we'll see in our context today. And that is that the church is the present day. The church is the place that God is today presently using. And where God's uh, where God is speaking through and where the gospel is going out of. The church is God's plan for today. That's the present. But there's going to be a day and it's going to be any time when God takes His church out of this world. And at that time, that's the future events are going to take place. And those events have to do with judgment. And we looked at all those judgments. And I want to remind you as believers that we need to be very, very careful to mind our own business. That is, we need to know what, what we're supposed to be doing. You know, even this last week, uh, I had some emails and some correspondence with people that were disparaging Christ's church. In other words, they were telling me all the problems with all the churches. And it's true, isn't it? We know churches have problems, and we know why that they have problems, and I'll just be common sense to us that problem people make problem churches, and that God loves problem people. This morning in Teen Sunday School, we looked at the ninety and nine sheep, and how that uh, Jesus was accused of eating, or of receiving publicans and sinners and eating with them. And Jesus gave a parable to them, and he said, you know, which man, which man having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, will not leave ninety-nine in the wilderness and go out and seek his sheep? And when he finds him, he'll bring him back in his fold and say to people, Rejoice with me, for my sheep which was lost is found. And we realize that God's interested in the lost. God's interested in those that are outsiders. That uh, This is Tony. Tony's here, so you can ask him all the questions. We've got a lot of things for you, Tony. And so we're glad that you made it so you can do all the things you need to do today. Got a lot to do. All right. Uh, 
Uh, but we're glad. Uh oh, uh, but Jesus rejoices over one lost sheep that comes to the fold. And let me just remind you about something. You know the church that everybody tells you has all kinds of problems? Do you know whose idea that was? Who came up with the whole church thing? Jesus did. You know what the church is? The church is called the bride of Jesus Christ. She's His bride. And what man doesn't love his bride? So Jesus is in love with His church. I just want to tell you something. If Jesus is God, and He is, I'm not saying that if in the sense that He may not be. If Jesus is God and if Jesus loves His church, you might want to be kind of careful about what you think about her and what you say about her. And instead of, of uh, disparaging her, work on sanctifying, work on the sanctification aspect of it. But we live in the church age today. That's the present day. And that's what we need to be really, really heavily involved in is God's plan, the church. Okay, so chapters 2 and 3 talk about the church age. Interestingly, when we studied through Revelation, though we never saw the church, from chapter 4 all the way until today's context, when we're reminded that this letter was written to the church. And so you never see the church again ever in Revelation. good writer gives you an outline, tells you what it's going to say. And John said we're going to talk about the past, the present, the future. Presence is the church, chapters 2 and 3 in the letters to the seven churches. But from there on, chapter 4 to 22 in Revelation, we never see the church again mentioned. The reason for that is she's gone. She's not there. She's not a participant in these future events. And so then we saw in chapter 5, we saw the seven seals. And uh, we know that Jesus was the lamb that was worthy to open the book of the seven seals. And the seven seals were judgments. They were the seal judgments that Daniel, and if you're studying the prophecy of Daniel as parallel to this, Daniel was told not to write those things, but to seal them up because the time wasn't yet. And now we're told in Revelation, unseal those things. Don't seal them up because the time is at hand. Lord, this is the next event on God's calendar are, is, are these future seal judgments. So we saw each of those judgments, and uh, the final one of those seal judgments, the seventh seal, were woe judgments. Woe, woe, woe. And each of those woes were literally terrible events where God's wrath was meted out on, uh, on the wicked, on the unbelieving. Uh, we saw in the midst of that, we saw the introduction to Israel. We saw the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that had the seal of God on their foreheads. And we saw that, that in this period of time, God will be working through national Israel. Many individuals will become believers because of the 144,000 who are witnesses. But the, uh, the future kingdom is not a church, it's Israel. That's what the, God is going to be working through. And it's a reminder to us that this era, this time when God is working through His church, is going to be a short-lived era. And this is one of those whosoever will. We're going to see it again in, in our context today. This is one of those eras where God says, everyone, come. Come be part of this. But one day it's not going to be that way. One day it's going to be Israel, and it's going to be people that have to come through Israel. And uh, that's the way it used to be. It's the way it'll be in the future. God's uh, salvation's always been the same way, by grace, through faith. And But it's important for us to realize that we live in the best time there ever has been to preach the gospel. We need to take full advantage of the time and day and age in which we live. Uh, the seventh seal, there, there were seven seals, there were three woes. Uh, that takes us through chapter 8. And uh, then we saw uh, the seven trumpets you know, in chapter 8. Or, so we saw seven trumpets, and then we have the, the three woes. And then at the, the third woe, we are introduced to seven angels, which have uh, seven judgments, or they have seven plagues, where God literally is just destroying earth and destroying mankind. In each of these seven plagues, they have seven vials that they pour out their plagues. And that's in chapter uh, 15, takes us all the way to chapter 16. Uh, there are a lot of things I can't mention. I just don't have time to cover. Uh, but we saw the midpoint of the, of the tribulation in chapter 12 and verse 6. And in chapter 11, we saw the first three and a half years, two periods of three and a half years. You've got to watch the messages where we preach that because we don't have time to review it all here today. Then in chapter 18, we saw the destruction of Babylon. We saw this great city that men loved because of the things that they were to gain from her. And we saw her destroyed, literally destroying the lusts that men desire after. And 
destroy that fleshly city and men crying after it. And then finally, uh, we see the beast and the dragon, which is the devil, in chapters 18 through 20. And we see this final war, uh, or we see the, war, the this great battle where they come out to fight the Lord Jesus. And it's incredible to me. You know, we live in, in times when we see this uh, this juxtaposition or this, this war between the Satan and God. And oftentimes we elevate Satan to God's level. But it's very, very fascinating to me, first of all, when all the evil in the world come up against God, Jesus Christ speaks, and with the sword of His mouth, literally blood flows to the brothers. In other words, He speaks the destruction of everyone. And then when Satan is bound and cast into the pit for the thousand-year reign, an angel does it. God sends an angel to grab the devil and put him in the pit. And friend, I just want to remind you uh, that Satan may be more mighty than you are and I, but there's not really a valid war uh, uh, between good and evil and God and the devil. Good has already triumphed. Read sometime the last chapters, chapter 15 and 16 of 1 Corinthians, and just see that, that the final blow to death has already been dealt. The cross is already the great victory over death and over sin. And Jesus Christ has already won that victory. It's not a future event. It's a, it's a present event which, was, which happened in the past, but it's something that's enduring. My friend, the, the devil cannot win. He doesn't have a chance. It's not close. There isn't this rivalry between God and Satan as we see it. The reality of it is, is that there are a lot of people, if you were to uh, find out, if you could see into the hearts of men and see who is in rebellion against God and who bows to God, we certainly know that there will be more in rebellion than those who are bowing to God. My friend, that's only indicative of the evil hearts of men. That has nothing to do with Satan and his power. He is not a contender in the war against God. After the thousand year reign, he's going to be released and there's going to come one final rebellion. And the, the simple end of that rebellion is that there's going to be a great white throne judgment. God's just going to judge all the wicked. Death and hell are uh, going to be judged and the sea are going to give up the dead and, that are in them. And death and hell are going to be cast in the lake of fire and that's the second death and that means it's over. No more evil. We saw then the new heaven and the new earth that God's going to make in the city of Jerusalem. We saw the description of that city last week. We preached a message on the wall and the wall that matters the one that surrounds that great city of Jerusalem. We saw a lot of important significance about that wall. And uh, we will actually see the gates of it referred to again. Are you in chapter 22 now? Sure. All right. We're, I, I wish I could do a better job summarizing this morning, but I do not have the time. And uh, I, sometimes there's a little bit of an overload anyway. You just throw so much information. People are like, I don't know. I was trying to look at the blessing in chapter 1 and verse 3, and, and that's, that's where you lost me. So, I want just, us to just look at some truths here today. If you're jotting notes, I'll just tell you which each of them is. The first one is what Jesus said in verse 12, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. And that's not, no, not only the manner of His coming, that is the time frame in which He's coming. You know, first century believers very, very plainly revealed that they expected the Lord Jesus to come in their lifetime. They didn't expect to die. Matter of fact, Paul had to write the church at Thessalonica a special letter explaining to them what happened to believers which died and had to be buried in the ground and talk about the resurrection to them because they didn't think that anyone would die before the Lord Jesus returned. You say, Pastor, when do you think Jesus is coming? Well, probably today. Probably today. Jesus is coming quickly. John's conclusion to the letter is, even so, Lord Jesus, come. He's coming. Behold, I come. And, and John said, come on. And I can imagine uh, that he felt much like many of us do on some days. Here he is exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and he's been through terrible suffering. He's seen the Gospel mightily go forth around the world, and literally, in, in, in just a few short years, literally the Gospel he preached around the world, and the church has become this mighty, unstoppable uh, force that evidences the power of the Holy Ghost. And John's saying, God, you've done a great work, now it's time to come. You know, I have days when I just think, you know, I wish the Lord Jesus would come. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul, remember when he talks about how that, you know, he has a struggle in him, whether to be absent from the body. So to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And in his mind, is part of him said, come on, I, I want to be with the Lord Jesus. And a part of him wanted to say, well, you know what, I want to see, I, I enjoy God's work. And that's the way I feel. Now, I'll just tell you, life is wonderful. 
when you're born again, when you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, this corrupt world is something that's actually able to be enjoyed, isn't it? You know, God made this creation, and I can't imagine what the new heaven and the new earth are going to look like, but God made a wonderful place. And despite evil that's in this world, the Holy Spirit's ability to uh, withstand evil makes this a pretty bearable place to live. I cannot imagine the day when God removes His Spirit and no longer, uh, no longer halts or stops evil. I don't want to be around here then. But even so, man, I have days when I say, you know, I wish I could just be with the Lord Jesus. I just wish, you know, I, I wish it were all done. Then another part of me says, no, I want to do something for Jesus first. And I feel like in my short life, I haven't served the Lord. I haven't done anything that's significant. I want to have some eternal rewards. And we'll see that in our context. But the, the final conclusion, the last promise that is made to, for John to reveal to the church is, I come quickly and my reward is with me. For you believers that don't know that God rewards you. First of all, don't play the pious, I'm undeserving individual. You know, I don't deserve a reward. Well, of course you don't. Everybody knows that. You don't deserve to be born again. You don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve any of that. But friend, God's really good and I want some of His goodness. I want to take advantage of it. Uh, you know, none of us deserve anything actually and it's a good mindset to begin with. But don't let your undeserving be the point or be applied by you're not partaking in the things God has. And everything you do for the Lord Jesus Christ, before you were saved, your righteousness was as filthy rags. But everything you do as a believer for the Lord Jesus Christ, God's got a full record of. And He has a reward for you. And we ought to be living for that reward. We're going to literally be able to live in light of our service to the Lord Jesus Christ, the works we've done, to him, done for Him for eternity. And it's worth it to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You better, uh, you better uh, count for your life now. You better number your days in such a way that you are concerned with what you'll have when His reward is with Him. When He brings that time, that day and age of reward. You know, I, I, priorities are something we all struggle with, aren't they? It really bothers me after a week of just and being busy every single minute, getting up in the morning and going till bedtime at night, it bothers me after a week when I think back and wonder what I did that week. Because there was nothing that was really eternally significant. And you and I need to schedule eternally significant events in our lives because His reward's with Him. That's our first uh, point of application in our context today. Jesus said, I'm not new on the scene and I'll be here uh, when everyone's gone. Verse 13, I'm Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then, uh, like every good letter does, it concludes, when you have the introduction, it tells you what's going to be said, and then at the end, it concludes and said, this is what I've said. And uh, here we see again the theme of the letter of Revelation. Blessed is, are they that do His commandments. Is that what, what uh, the letter said in the beginning in verse 3? Isn't that what it said? Blessed are they that, uh, what is it? I better, I'm going to misquote if I don't read it. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Again, we're reminded there's a blessing. And this is, uh, this is a linguistic tool. We call this uh, sometimes what is called, uh, the illustration means bookends, but it's inclusio. In other words, when you have, maybe on a desk, maybe you have a couple of bookends, and you have books between, uh, and maybe you have a set of encyclopedias, everything in the set goes together between the bookends. And everything in between verse 3 and verse 14 of Revelation goes together in the information that we are to process in order to have God's blessing in our lives. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Blessed is, uh, blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now, I'm not going to get into this here. I don't think... I don't think this is a crowd that would go this direction anyway. This is not Jesus saying this is how you get into heaven. But these are things that you do and that will make it so that as you enter through these gates which were described, these 12 gates into this great city, uh, that, the, that you'll have a right. In other words, right is an access word. It's a, one of those things where it's mine. You ever feel as though uh, when... You ask God, for instance, for forgiveness for sin. You ever feel like you don't have the right? I, I, I mean, I just don't feel right, you know. I mean, 
about sin for me is this. I try to be an honest person, and sometimes I am. And honestly, when I sin, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an ignorant sinner. I don't know when the last time I lost my temper and thought it was okay. You know, I, just, you know, I didn't know it was bad to lose my temper. I wouldn't have lost it if I knew that. No, I lost it because I'm a sinner. Of course, you know, these people play the game of willful sin. When's the last time you sinned unwillfully, unknowingly? You know, the reality of it is, is that you know what sin is, and when you do it, you do it on purpose. And you're guilty. And, uh, you know, I know that. When, and I just, man, I'll tell you, First John, it just means so much to me. You know, th that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He goes on to say, if, anyone, if we say we have not sinned, make Him a liar. In other words, we've all sinned, and so we know who it's written to. It's written to the beloved, to the brethren, so that we can have fellowship with Him. And man, when I go to God a lot of times, I come, I, you know, I kind of creep into the throne room. You know, like, I don't know I don't deserve to be here. But you know, the Bible says we're supposed to go into the throne room of God with boldness. And it's actually incredible because we have the right to be there. And the right to be there is not on the basis of a merit because of something that we have done in order for ourselves to be worthy to enter that holy throne room of God. The reason we go there is because we come in the, in, in, with the person of Jesus Christ. We come with the position of the Lord Jesus Christ and we walk right in like we belong there because we do. And that's the way the word right is used here in this verse. In other words, we have the right to be there. And it's a right which is not earned based upon our righteousness, but our righteousness is actually ours because it was given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ and it actually is our own righteousness. Now, you don't need self-righteousness. You have His righteousness, but you are righteous. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a marvelous truth? about the Lord Jesus. And then uh, we see those individuals that will never be in that city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters. And whoso loveth and maketh a lie. And I don't, I don't think that needs to be our emphasis today. I want to move right on to verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Again, to whom is this intended? To whom is the blessing that were promised in verse 3 of chapter 1, to whom is it intended? It's us. We ends if you're from up south. And we're the folks that God is promising these things to. And He says, Blessed uh, are, are in, in uh, verse 16. He says, I, Jesus, have sent Mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. And then we come to the invitation. That's where we finish up Revelation is in the invitation. In verse 17, the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Come on. Come. Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. Now again, we go back to chapter 1 and verse 3, don't we? What are the words? Blessed are they that read and that hear and that do the things that are written in this book. This is us. And here Jesus is saying, come on, come on, you're invited. This is an invitation. Come, come. Let everyone that heareth say, come. Hey, you know who that is? That's the person sitting in your seat who's being addressed here. And it's just one of these things where I'm reminded of how personal the Word of God is. How personal this letter is. And when God tells us, read my Word, know my Word, and uh, know the blessings that are in it. It's a personal letter, personally written to you by God Himself. It's incredible to me how many believers want God to speak to them, and they're not even interested in looking at what He says in His Word to them. This book is personal. You know, I want a personal message from God. I want a message for me. Friend, how more personal does it get to say, whosoever will may come? Come. And this is completely, entirely consistent with the character and nature of our God. God's not an excluder. He's not an excluder. You know, being part of the family of Christ is, is uh, there are some, some great benefits to it, aren't there? But you know what I love about the family, this family? I love how inclusive it is. It's not an exclusive family, it's an inclusive family. You join a club, what's the purpose of a club? It's usually to keep certain people out. In other words, you make qualifications so some people can't join the club. And it's inclusive. It makes you feel good because you're included. But this one isn't like that. You know, I remember some years ago, back when we had, we started the, our church, we had a bunch of single people that uh, were, were uh, part of our church. And a couple of them have held out. 
and remain single. We got Tony still held out. Charlie's faltering. He's almost at the end of his <laughs> leash, but uh, he's he was one of the single guys. We had about ten of them living in a duplex, and uh, it was a lot of fun there. And uh, we we really they <laughs> made a lot of memories, a lot of uh, interesting things uh, that went on. And I have a point of saying that. Oh, and I remember Brother Alex, Brother Alex, and he's a guy who was he's a Filipino guy, and. Uh, he had to really listen carefully to what Alex would say because he never said anything directly. He always hinted at things. For instance, he would never tell you, I'm really upset about something. He would tell you what happened and assume that you know he's upset because of what happened. I'm like, oh, okay, that's an interesting story. You know, and, but what he means, I'm really mad about this. You know, but he was always he was very polite in the way he would say things. One of the things he came out and said one time, though, he said, you know, I wouldn't be friends with any of you guys if we weren't saved. <laughs> he said, you know, he said, we just don't have, what he said is, we don't have anything in common. And what he's probably saying is, I don't like any of you people, actually. <laughs> but we're, I mean, they are, they're best friends. I mean, Charlie and Alex have been best friends forever, but Charlie, Alex wouldn't like you if he wasn't saved. But you, you're being late would just drive him nuts. He'd be done with it in no time. Uh, they're just, I mean, he wouldn't like Tony. He definitely wouldn't like you, would he, Tony? But, uh, you know, they're all, they're all close friends. They're good friends. You know why? Because they're part of that family. Part of that family. You know, you can look around this room here and you're sort of a motley crew, isn't it? We all just have different backgrounds, different places that we are from, different things that we like. But man, aren't we family? Don't we belong and fit together well? Yeah. And you know what it is? It's because of this statement the Lord Jesus made, which is, come. This is the inclusive family. This family doesn't exclude anybody. This is the one where the Lord Jesus des desires the most wicked of sinners. He desires all the unrighteous to come. And we all qualify in the same way for that, don't we? And we have that same thing in common. And uh, just, it's what a lovely reminder. What a lovely reminder of God's mindset, His attitude toward us. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. What's the Bride? Well, we know what the Bride is, the church. And He's used the word church in verse 16. Again, never saw church from chapter 4 and, and, and up to this point. Verse 17, or verse 18 is a warning that comes with it. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Well, I read the book, did you? I don't think I'm interested in participating in any of the plagues that are written in this book. They're pretty terrible. They're intended for God's enemies. And I'll tell you from two perspectives. One, I'm a little bit of a chicken when it comes to the kind of things these people are going to go through. And another thing is I don't want to be God's enemy. And so I don't want to be, participate in this. And this is, this is a warning to us, a very, very stern warning of the importance of not adding to or taking away from God's message. You know, I fear that even in solid, fairly uh, uh, fundamental uh, Bible circles, that oftentimes for the purpose of manipulation or persuasion, individuals are willing to add a little bit to kind of enforce some things that they want in the church. And you know, well, we have to be careful about that. Don't add anything to God's Word. Just don't add it. If it isn't in the Scripture, then it's because God didn't intend for it to be there. And it's very, very important for us to take heed to this warning. You say, Pastor, what does God mean? God will add to him the plagues that are in this book. I can only speculate. The nearest thing I could say would be that you're not going up when the Lord Jesus stands in the sky and calls us up. And you're going to be part of these plagues. The other thing, of course, would be that you'll be a participant in this final judgment that we see where you're cast into hell. Uh, what is it when a person disregards the Word of God? When they take what God has said and they disregard it or they change it or they avoid it. You know, this was, I was helped to understand this some years ago when we did our Essentials of Salvation Sunday School series. And we just basically looked at things. You know, when we, there's just all kinds of denominations and different beliefs and even, quote, Christian denominations and faiths. And we want to ask the question, who does God receive? In other words, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're all God's children. Well, it's true we're all God's creation, but we aren't all His children. And there are certain requirements, certain things that are non-negotiables when it comes to knowing God. 
And so we boiled them down in a Sunday school class. We really came down to, without the Word of God, it's impossible to know who God is. If you don't have a Bible, you're just making up a God. He's just whoever you decide He is. So if God isn't who He revealed Himself as in His Word, then He's just a concocted, man-made, uh, man-imagined God. He's not God. He's who He says He is in His Word. And a couple of the other things that we uh, saw was that salvation is by faith in Christ alone. And so one of the things that we did was we went to some other religions and did interviews. We went to a mosque and interviewed an imam. And we asked the imam at the mosque about the essentials of salvation. And you know, they just said, well, yeah, the Bible, blah, 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 it's good, 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 good. We have some things in addition to that. And that really helped us right away. It just gives you a lot of clarity. Okay, all right? There's a curse to that. We went to the Catholic Church. And it was really interesting how deceitful, how deceitful they actually were, but how clear it was. When we, we didn't go there to debate or argue. We just said, these, we, we believe these to be the essential of, of the faith. Do you agree with this? Oh, these are wonderful. This is so good. We agree with everything you say. And then spend about an hour adding to it. God says, uh-uh. I'm going to add to you the plagues that are written in this book. We could have gone to any number of denominations and found the same thing. You and I need to be careful to take this book and recognize that it's God-given, that it's inspired, that it's perfect, that it's preserved, and it's so important for us to hold it up and say, I won't accept anything being added, and I won't accept anything being taken from it at all. And when we find ourselves tempted to do so, to resist those urges, it's dangerous. There's a curse. The Bible says the curse is the plagues that are written in this book. And friend, I don't want to be a participant in those plagues. And so then we see one more reminder in verse 20. And this is, I believe, John speaking for himself here. Up to this point, John has been speaking, the, writing the things which he's told to write. But here he said, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. Last thing I want to remind you of believers is that there isn't much time. You say, Pastor, that was 2,000 years ago. Almost 2,000 years ago that John said, Surely I come quickly. Yeah, and you know what that means? It means we're 2,000 years nearer. 2,000 years nearer to that time. Jesus is coming soon. You say, when do you think it will be? Well, it might be today. Might be today. So you either better be practicing your Superman moves and your I told you so emotions uh, when you get taken up. Because it's it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. We're gonna be called up. Yes. Can those plagues that um, be for believers that are saved? No, I no, you couldn't you couldn't deny this word and be a believer. That I, that was the point I was trying to make a moment. Change it, that just sprinkle a little extra, what about that? Well it just kinda tells you what they are. Kind of reveals what they are. In other words, uh, you were there when we did the interview, and you remember, you remember the guy saying, I agree with everything you say. You think he's saved? Well, I'm talking about more people that would be like it for independent Baptist church, like certain people on the internet who do claim, who do speak the gospel yeah. correctly, but then they add all these other things and deny the rapture and all that other stuff. Um, I can't answer for knowing the hearts of every individual. I don't know the heart of any individual except for this one. You know, I know whether or not I'm, I know what I am before the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so to answer that question specifically, you know, you can't add to or take away from the words of this prophecy. And I'm not necessarily sure what you're talking about. I think is misapplication. And that's a dangerous place to be. Dangerous place to be. Let me just say, we, we, we don't have time to preach this message. But an important study for you as a believer sometime is to study apostasy. The word apostasy is going away from. It means wandering away from. That is, it implies going from truth to error. I know many individuals that are apostate that I believe were not apostate when they came to Jesus. But it's interesting as well when you study false teachers in the Scripture. I used to think that false teachers were deceived, but I came to realize that they are not. They're deliberately teaching error. Now, if you're concerned about truth and you're afraid of a powerful God who judges the wicked... You just can't relate to that. You, you know, you, you could ask me, Pastor, how could someone teach that? 
Well, the answer is they're a false teacher, and I couldn't do that. I mean, I'm right about everything, but I couldn't teach uh, false teaching and lead people deliberately away from truth. But false teachers do, and they do so deliberately. And the simple answer to it is, is that it reveals what's actually going on inside. In other words, they're pretenders. They're not real. Who knows the answer to that? Well, I don't think that this, the, the final statement on this, I don't think that this is written for the purpose of us going around with a microscope trying to figure out who's going to be part of the plagues. I think it's to make us afraid. In other words, this is an introspective reference, not an extra. You understand that? In other words, it's made to make us look at ourselves rather than to look at others. And it just makes me say, well, I better be careful. You know, when you're not filled with the Spirit, your logic and your reason, man, you can just be nutty. And you can just you can just go off the deep end on things. Anybody can. And uh, you know, you just, I better watch out. I better be careful. And that's the purpose of this warning. And God's purpose isn't to make believers doubt or question or say, wow, you know what? I don't know if I'm in truth or not. Yes, you know what truth is. You know what truth is. The Holy Spirit of God witnesses it. And if you have a humble heart that bows before God and says, God, I'm open to truth. And you don't come to God with a preconceived notion or a your your own um, concept of what truth is. You can know truth and be confident of it. That's why I love Second Peter chapter one, when the scripture says, "Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation." In other words, God says what He means, and He means what He says, and it's it's written in a way that we can know it and understand it. And 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 and, and final commentary. Let me ask you this question. Isn't it wonderful how easy Revelation actually is to understand? I mean, we oh, it's just all oh, these deep, hard to understand. No, it's not. It is mysteries revealed. And when you approach it with that kind of a mindset with the help of the Holy Spirit of God, you get done with it and you're like, wow. That's, that's just as plain as the nose on your face. And that's, that's the way God is with truth. So I hope that answers your question. And if it's not an adequate answer to your question, uh, there's some brilliant people here that could probably answer better than I can. I'll point you to them later. All right, Andrew. Andrew will answer you. All right. Hey, that's it. We're out of time today. Uh, let me just let's just let's have an invitation, a little different invitation this morning uh, than what we usually do for it. The invitation this morning is come, come. If you're here this morning, you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Can I tell you something? You don't have to question whether or not God wants you to be part of His eternal plan. He does. He does. He wants you. And He says, come. Come on. Come on. He's done everything necessary. One of the things that you know on the basis of just common sense in your history is that you're not worthy of God. He's perfect. He's sinless. And you and I are sinners. And the Bible says because of that, we've fallen short of the glory of God. One of the things we know, though, is that God loves sinners. That's an incredible thing about God. So the hardest thing for me to understand is how a perfect God can love sinners. But I know He does, and He proved it because His sinless Son came miraculously, was born of a virgin, did miracles that proved that He was God, and ultimately died on the cross for sin, which He had not committed, but which I committed, and which you've committed. And God offered salvation as eternal gift and made it really, really simple. Really simple to receive. Jesus told Nicodemus, He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I don't have time to, to go over Deuteronomy 21, uh, but the, suffice it to say, in order to look to the serpent in the wilderness, you had to turn your head to Him. And in order to be saved, in order to be saved, my friend, it's as simple as saying, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want, I want to come. I want to be your child. You say, Pastor, I don't know the whole Bible. I haven't read. I don't know all the doctrine. I don't know what I'm in for. My friend, you go to Lord Jesus and then uh, <laughs> you receive Him as your Savior. And God, you'll grow. You'll get in the Word of God. You'll learn a lot of things. But it isn't what you know that saves you. It's who you know. It's the Lord Jesus. You're here this morning. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. The invitation? Come. The second part of the invitation this morning would simply be this. You want to have the blessing that God promises to those that read and that hear, and that do the things that are written in this book of prophecy? I do. I do. Well, then let's do the things that are written in this book. Father, thank you for what we've learned here today. And I just ask that you would just reinforce these truths in our minds and our hearts. And God, we just thank you so much for the kind of Savior that you are. Lord, it's just such a glimpse into your heart. 
when after all these plagues against the wicked that we see in the future, we see that currently your attitude is that you want whosoever will to come to you. We thank you for this. God, you're a wonderful God. You're a wonderful Savior. And Jesus is all we need. I pray uh, that we would come to know the blessings that are written in this book. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have any questions? Any questions today? I'm always available after the services uh, for you. I'll be gone a little earlier today than usual. Uh, but if you are here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I have some questions about the series or some questions about the, what the Bible says, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'm also available all the time during the week. You may notice in our church information uh, a phone number that you can call. And on purpose, that phone number is my cell phone because I want to be readily accessible to you. So you can contact me any way that you like to. You can send a text. You can call my phone. Or you could, if you like to, you could send me an email. Or you can find me on Facebook and haunt me there. Or I mean, send me a message or whatever. We're very, very available for you. I'd love to discuss any you have questions about. If you want to do personal Bible study, I'm always available for you. And I enjoy that as well. Thank you so much for being here this morning. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.